Welcome to everybody. Hendrik is already there. He has experimented, so we're uh, delighted to have him uh, speak at our second Zoominar. I want to thank him uh, for having accepted to be uh, to this uh, to explore this new media medium. I will ask you to turn the, off your uh, microphone so we have only uh, Hendrik's voice. And Hendrik, it's your your turn, please. Thank you, Yvon. Uh, thanks for the kind invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, in Montreal virtually. Um, um, so what do I want to uh, talk about? Uh, this is some recent work um, with a former student of mine. Uh, his name is Pan Lian. Uh, so he did his PhD in Ghent with me and he is now a lecturer at Tianjin Normal University. And my talk is actually uh, um, a recap of two papers we wrote together, one about three years ago when he was in Ghent and the other one very recently, we only put it on the archive about a month ago. Um, I'm borrowing mostly from the most recent paper, but some of the ideas also come from the older paper. Um, so what is the topic? The topic is the, the Dunkel intertwining operator. Um, and I'll uh, start with some, some background uh, for those who are not too familiar with that. I'll talk about Dunkel operators and what they are, and I'll talk about two important um, operators or transforms that exist in this context. One is the Dunkel transform. This generalizes the Fourier transform. And the other one is the intertwining operator. Uh, then I'll move to some results of uh, Yuan Xu um, from Oregon. Um, he has been working on this intertwining operator for dihedral groups uh, about one or two years ago. And his results inspired us to, 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 uh, to develop them uh, a bit more. Uh, and so I'll explain that uh, in, in when we come to uh, uh, the approach of uh, Pananin. So let's, uh, let's uh, get started. Um, so what are Dunkel operators? Um, so I have to apologize. Uh, the, the, the theory of Dunkel operators uh, carries quite a bit of formulas with it. And, and those formulas can be a little bit long. But I'll, I'll try to focus on what is, uh, what is really important. Um, and um, uh, so it's not that important to remember all four. So um, we define these Dunkel operators. We define them in, uh, say, Rm, uh, Euclidean space of uh, dimension m. What do we need? We need a few things, uh, a few data. Um, we need a finite reflection group, G. Uh, this finite reflection group has a root system. Let's call it R. And let's uh, select a positive uh, uh, system uh, within R. We need a multiplicity function. What is that? That is a, a function kappa that maps the root system to the complex numbers. This function uh, has to be G invariant. Uh, so essentially um, what you have is you have your reflection group acting on your root system. This creates a finite number of orbits and to every orbit of the reflection group on the root system, you attach a, a complex number. This is the notation for the inner product. And this is the notation for a reflection. Um, what is alpha? Alpha is a, a vector in our root system. And sigma alpha is the reflection in the hyperplane perpendicular uh, to alpha. And using this information, we can build the Dunkel operator. And we can build them for any vector psi in Rm. And what is T of psi acting on a function f? Well, it's the directional derivative of f with respect to xi plus some deformation terms. Those are depicted here. I'm sorry to interrupt, but are you screen sharing now? Uh, do you see the slides or, or? I don't see anything whatsoever. Oh? There, I, I see the slides. Does someone uh, see the? Is there someone else beside John who doesn't see the, the slide? I think it's, John, it's your problem at your side because everybody sees it. Maybe uh, use the top line, the, the top screen. There must be a, 
uh, options to see. Ivan, I'm very sorry, I don't want to disrupt, but I can't see anything, so I'm going to just um, log out and try to log in again. Okay, okay. good. Henrik will uh, go on in the meantime. I'll send the slides, the PDF of the slides also to Ivan, and then he can share them with the others. Uh, uh, that could be convenient too, maybe, um, if somebody else experiences a problem. Okay. Okay. So those are sent. Okay. So let me continue. Good. So our Dunkel operator is partly a partial derivative and then a finite sum of deformation terms. What do we have? We have divided differences. We take a function f of x and subtract f where I reflect the argument over uh, the reflection sigma alpha. And I divide by the inner product of the root with x. I multiply with another inner product and I multiply with the multiplicity function evaluated at the root alpha. And I do this sum for all the roots in my uh, positive subsystem. This looks a little bit complicated. I'll give two uh, very concrete examples on the next two slides. Um, in particular, when xi are the basis vectors, ej, we just denote these operators by tj, where j then runs from 1 up to m. Um, these operators were introduced about 30 years ago, following up on some, some uh, earlier attempts by uh, Charles Dunkel um, in this, in this uh, seminal paper. Uh, and later on, there, are, there have been, um, th th there is a, a book that talks about them too. Uh, this is the book by Dunkel and, and Shu. Uh, this is the second edition. Uh, there is an older first edition, um, maybe 10 years earlier or so. So let's have a look at how these operators look like uh, when you spe start specifying the reflection group. So let's first look at the one dimensional case. So let's work on the real numbers. We only have one reflection group there. This is the reflection group Z2 corresponding to the root system A1. What is the reflection corresponding uh, to, to my root that is just the operator capital R that sends f of x to f of minus x, right? And my Dunkel operator, t of x, um, there's now only a single Dunkel operator, becomes the derivative by x plus 1 minus r, uh, so my function minus the function reflected, divided by x, and multiplied with a constant k. This is my multiplicity function, which is now constant uh, on this root system. This is the simplest case, and this is also a case where essentially everything is known. Um, this includes the Dunkel transform, we'll introduce later, and the intertwining operator we'll also introduce later. So this is a very simple case. Um, this is for the root system A1, so let me also show you the root system AN. Oh, I'm skipping a slide here. So this is the case when you have the symmetric group, the symmetric group uh, acting on Rm by permutation of the standards or the basis vectors. I've given the root system here, which is now the root system Am minus one. Um, the symmetric group uh, only has one orbit when it acts on the root, this root system. So my multiplicity function becomes a constant. There's only one orbit of G on R. What are my Dunkel operators? Well, this complicated definition of the first slide becomes the following thing. So t uh, for the direction ei becomes partial uh, derivative in the direction ei plus kappa, my uh, constant, times uh, this sum for all j different from i. So what I do is I take my function, I subtract from my function sigma ij of f, this means interchanging uh, the i and the j variable of the function. I divide by xi minus xj and I take this sum, right? Now, um, if you look at this formula, this looks a lot simpler than the general formula for an arbitrary reflection group. But once you start doing actual computations, um, you, you start to realize that there is often uh, not so big difference in doing computations for arbitrary groups or for specific reflection groups. 
And that's maybe a theme I, I want you to keep in mind um, because this is what, what's causing uh, some of the problems uh, with the theory or, or with developing new results in, in the theory of doom cooperators. So, what are the basic properties of these doom cooperators? So I have listed some of them here. Um, what is quite uh, quite a surprise is that they are still commutative. So if I take Dunkel operators corresponding to two basis vectors, EI and EJ, then TI, TJ is TJ, TI, which is not at all obvious if you just look at this formula. This was the first result proved by Dunkel in, his, in the paper where he introduced these operators. A second important property is that T of Xi maps polynomials to polynomials of precisely one degree less. This is again not obvious. Uh, it's clear for the first term, the derivative does that. But this sum of divided differences, that is not so clear and it requires, uh, it requires a proof. Um, you can construct a Laplacian, which is called the Dunkel Laplacian. Um, the notation is delta with a subindex k, will, which is the multiplicity function. And this is a sum of the squares of my Dunkel operators corresponding to the basis. Note that if the multiplicity function is zero, then kappa here is zero, then the entire sum here disappears and the Dunkel Laplacian becomes the regular, regular Laplacian. What can I now also do? And this will be important for the sequel. I can introduce a weight, uh, omega sub k. This is a weight given by products of uh, inner products with root vectors to a certain power. Uh, and this is a, the weight is selected in such a way that if we consider uh, this inner product, the inner product of two functions f and g, um, so this is the standard L2 inner product, but now for the measure w uh, omega kappa, uh, well, then these Dunkel operators become skewer joints. So tj of f uh, inner product with g becomes minus f inner product with tg uh, j of g. So this is really a crucial property. Of course, when kappa is zero, the measure becomes just one. Um, and this is the, the basic property of the partial derivative, uh, right? Um, uh, so, so integration by parts. Okay, so these are the basic properties. And Rick, uh, John has a question, so... Go ahead. Go ahead, John. Yeah, just very quick. Uh, is it uh, clear from this that the Dunkel Laplacian it really is just a differential operator and involves no permutation operators? Um, it still uh, involves uh, uh, permutation operators. They don't disappear. Ah, so yeah. I thought that for the case, for instance, of uh, Kaloger Moser, that in fact it's just a Laplacian plus some potential term and that there were no permutations. No, 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 no. The permutations are still there, but sometimes people consider the action on uh, uh, functions that, that ah. are, for example, invariant under ah. the group, and then yeah. some of these terms vanish. Ah. So that okay. could be uh, what you are referring to. I think so, yes, yes, yes. It has to do with the ordering of the particles. Yes, I see that Luke writes this uh, too in the chat. Yeah. So this is when you are acting on symmetric functions, essentially. Understood. Yeah. Thank you. So, two important operators. Uh, I already mentioned them in the beginning. The Dunkel transform generalizes the Fourier transform. And the intertwining operator, and that's the most mysterious one, maps the ordinary situation, so the situation with kappa equal to zero, to the Dunkel situation. So I'll define both and I'll discuss them. Um, I'll give a summary of the discussion here. There are some general results, but not too many. Um, but what is really lacking is detailed information for specific reflection groups. So writing down, for example, this Dunkel transform explicitly for um, the root system AN. This is not known. Um, also not for BN and so on. The Dunkel transform was introduced or studied in detail in this paper by the the Jeu, uh, uh, people, uh, person from the Netherlands, uh, in a famous Inventionist paper. 
the intertwining operator, um, the most important results are in these two papers, um, as you can see here. So let's go to the Dunkel transform. And for that, I first go back to the, the classical old Fourier transform. What is this? This is an integral transform that maps functions on Rm to functions on Rm. And how is it doing that? You multiply the function f of x by the exponential, standard exponential, and you integrate. And there is a certain constant to make it unitary, but that's not so important for this thing. What is the crucial property of the Dunkel transform, uh, of the Fourier transform? It maps derivatives to multiplication by variables and vice versa. So what do we want? We want a similar integral transform that does the same thing, but now with the partial derivatives replaced by the Dunkel operators. Now it speaks for itself that then you have to change the integral kernel of your integral transform. And this is really the mysterious object that now uh, arises, right? And this object is called the Dunkel curve. So let's have a look. This is the definition of the Dunkel transform. So it's an integral transform f sub kappa that maps functions on Rm to functions on Rm by integrating them with respect to the measure. This is the measure I introduced in my inner product. Um, and with respect to some integral kernel E sub kappa. What is E sub kappa? E sub kappa is the joint eigenfunction of all the Dunkel operators. So E kappa satisfies if I act with the Dunkel operator Tj in the variable x, it spits out the variable yj, right? And this is the crucial definition. Maybe I'll, I'll try this annotate tool. Um, so this is really the crucial property. Why is that? Because this property allows us to conclude this. What is the Dunkel transform doing? It maps the action of the Dunkel operators. Uh, here should be a kappa. Sorry for that. It's my mistake. Um, so it maps the action of the Dunkel operators to a multiplication by uh, the corresponding variable. How do you do that? Uh, you show this using the skew jointness of the Tj, which I uh, highlighted before. So if you have Tj acting here on f, by the skew jointness, this jumps with a minus sign to an action on e. The action on e is well known and gives me the variable yj. So this is how you, uh, how you get this result. Now, at this point, it's mysterious whether this uh, integral kernel E sub kappa, whether it exists, right? Um, if it exists, then it's clear that the transform satisfies it. And this is one of the first important uh, um, realizations. Uh, so I should now close this, yeah. Oh, okay, I'll, I have to clear this. Okay, so what are some of the abstract results known on this Dunkel transform? Well, this integral kernel that you need to define this, this transform, it exists and it's a real analytic function. This was proven by De Jeu in his, in his celebrated paper. He also proves that the kernel is bounded, so that the, the modulus is bounded by one. And so essentially that you can translate a lot of basic properties of the standard Fourier transform to this new integral. What he has also proven are some variants of Paley-Wiener theorems, but not the most general one. This is still elusive. And so these are essentially the main uh, abstract results which are known on this transform. What happens if you go look at concrete results? So can you write down this integral kernel E sub kappa explicitly? Well, in case the reflection group is Z2 acting on R, you can. It's a sum of two Bessel functions, and this is well understood and um, um, for a long time. There are some results on low dimensional cases um, that I mentioned two or three, often with some restrictions um, uh, on the multiplicity function. And what is also known is the case of dihedral groups. Uh, this is our work, and I will show the results later. So this is the situation for the Dunkel transform. 
Next, the intertwining operator. Oh, I skipped the slides. What is the intertwining operator? This is a, an, an important operator that maps the original situation to the new situation. So it's an operator that intertwines the partial derivatives with the Dunkel operators. And this is the theorem which was originally proven by Dunkel and then further studied in this uh, paper with De Jeu and Obdam. So if you act on the space of all polynomials on Rn, then there exists a unique linear and homogeneous isomorphism that maps one to one, that maps homogeneous polynomials of degree k to uh, homogeneous polynomials of the same degree, and that satisfies this intertwining property. Right? So this is, this is fairly easy to prove. What is not easy to prove is um, how this operator V kappa looks like. Right? And there the most important result is a result by uh, Margit Rösler. Um, she proved that V kappa can be represented by an integral transform of this type. So when it acts on a polynomial P, you integrate this polynomial P with respect to a complicated measure. Uh, and then you get uh, the intertwined pol polynomial. What she also proved is that this operator is positive if kappa is a positive uh, multiplicity function. What does this mean? If my polynomial is positive, then it's mapped to um, V kappa of P, which is also a, a positive polynomial. Um, this proof, uh, how she, ah, I see a question from John. It is indeed invertible, this operator. And the inverse is much simpler than, um, than V kappa itself. Um, I'll come back to that uh, uh, in a second. Um, so uh, this, this was proven using some, some complicated machinery. Uh, Margit Russler is a specialist in hypergroups uh, or something like that. And, and this really comes from that. Again, it becomes disappointing when you start to look at uh, concrete results. For Z2, there is a formula. I'll show them on, uh, it on the next slide. There are some low dimensional cases, um, but they are complicated. There is a, a paper by Dunkel on the S3 case, so the symmetric group on three elements. Uh, this is a paper of 30 pages using very complicated symplectic integrals. Um, it's really unpleasant, I would say. But so for dihedral groups, we were able to make uh, nice formulas and uh, I'll show them uh, at the end of the talk. So, in the one dimensional case, this is the formula for, um, for this uh, intertwining operator. So you take P uh, in X times T, you multiply with this, poly uh, this polynomial and you integrate from minus one to one. Now this is not the form in which Rösler's theorem is formulated. In order to do that, what you need to do, and I'll, I'll make an annotation here, um, you substitute xt, you call this y, you carry out the substitution, you get a p of y, and your measure becomes complicated. Your measure becomes this thing. This thing where there is an indicator function, uh, indicator of minus uh, modulus x to plus modulus x to, uh, to indicate the integration interval. This is what we call the Bochner representation of the intertwining operator. And it's really formulas of this type that we're after. Why is that? From this formula, you can read off the positivity of the intertwining operator. That otherwise is proven using this complicated machinery. Here, if P is positive polynomial, well, the measure is positive, which you can, uh, uh, if you look at it for a few minutes, you can see that it's uh, a positive uh, measure. So, after integration, you end up with something which is positive. So this kind of representation reflects the positivity result of Russler, and that is what we want to, to try to, to mimic in the case of dihedral groups. OK, so some conclusions. There is very little known about the explicit form of the Dunkel transform and the intertwining operator once you start looking at specific classes of reflection groups. And this is a bit problematic. First of all, if you want to do hard analysis for Dunkel operators, you really need these explicit forms. 
um, the amount of abstract results that we can get is more or less exhausted. It's also needed for selling the theory to outsiders. Um, if you want to convince a mathematical physicist that this is something useful, then maybe you want to show what the integral kernel is for some classes of, of reflection groups. It's also important for motivating researchers in the field. Um, these abstract results all date uh, 10, 20 years back. Um, the last 10 years, there have not been too many new results. And what you really need are these explicit forms to, to push everything uh, much further. So that's why I'm, I'm interested in this problem. OK. So this goes, my mouse is not so good. So let's move to the results of XU. So let's talk about dihedral groups. It's an infinite family of finite reflection groups acting in R2. So IK is the group of symmetries of the regular K gon. Now, when K is odd, there is only one orbit of um, my reflection group on this root system. So my multiplicity function is a complex number. When K is even, there are two ob ob orbits and my multiplicity function becomes uh, two complex numbers, essentially. I made some drawings. Uh, they are not very professional. Um, I'm still getting the hang of this. I would have drawn this on the blackboard. The I3 dihedral group is the group of symmetries of the triangle. Uh, and here are the positive roots indicated. I4 are the symmetries of the square. Um, and here you see again the positive roots V0, V1, V2, and V3. Now uh, about Two years ago, uh, Yuan posted, um, oh, let me first show you the, the Dunkel operators in this case. These are the Dunkel operators. I'm uh, displaying them here for the case where K is odd. So uh, odd dihedral groups, they act on functions of two variables, x1 and x2. And they are these sums, uh, rather complicated sums, where sigma j are the reflections over the lines perpendicular to my uh, positive roots. So these operators are complicated, and you can already feel that there is a bunch of nasty uh, trigonometry um, coming into play once you start to do some computation with these things. So what was Xu's theorem? Um, well, first of all, he made uh, two restrictions. He restricted to uh, multiplicity functions where the two constants are equal. This is for the case of, of uh, even dihedral groups, the first restriction. Second restriction, he does not consider arbitrary functions, but functions that are essentially only depending on one variable um, through this uh, dependence. So x1 and x2 are my coordinates in R2, and they are paired in this way. So I'm only intertwining functions of this type. And then he showed that the intertwining operator acting on such a function is given by an integral of this function with some um, auxiliary var variables uh, u of j. And the integral is over a simplex. So what is the simplex? This is a set of points in uh, a space of dimension k minus 1. All my coordinates are positive, And the sum of the coordinates is smaller or equal than 1. So when, um, yeah, so that, that was his result. I'll comment a little bit about how he arrived at this result. So his proof is by direct verification. He shows that this operator really intertwines the derivative with the Dunkel operator. The proof is elementary, but it's highly complicated. You need three pages of, of trigonometry, and you really need to keep your, your mind to it to, to get through all these computations. In his paper, uh, it's this paper where the result is, is posted, um, he writes, there is little methodology for identifying this integral transform. The discovery of our formula is motivated by a previous formula from another paper and is the result of trial and error starting from the dihedral group uh, of the square. The formula is not as general as we would want. There are conditions on the functions and on the multiplicity function. But what is intriguing is this appearance of an integral over the simplex. So what we want to do is essentially um, give better motivation and give a structural approach how this kind of result can be uh, derived. So, so this is what I'll try to explain next. Um, yeah. So 
What is our approach? First, another comment. There is a well-known formula that the Dunkel kernel is given by the action of the intertwining operator on this exponential function, on the standard kernel of the integral kernel of the Fourier transform. This formula um, seems to imply that it's easiest to first determine the intertwining operator and then from that knowledge find E of uh, the Dunkel kernel. This is not true in our experience. It seems easier to first determine E sub k and use that knowledge to determine V of kappa. And I'll show you a formula that allows you to do that um, in a second. Another comment is the following. My exponential function is a positive function. The intertwining operator is uh, maps positive functions to positive functions. So my Dunkel kernel should also be a positive function. We'll observe that later on with our final form. So what is our approach? We will derive a general formula for V sub kappa based on the knowledge of E sub kappa. Then we will determine the Dunkel kernel for dihedral groups, and this will follow from knowledge of the Poisson kernel in that case. What we will do is we will express this Dunkel kernel in terms of the second Humbert function. This is a function of, um, a hypergeometric function of Loricella type. And what is curious about this function is that it can be expressed as an integral over the simplex. So that already explains where Xu's result is coming from. Um, I will give the technical details, not for, the, for E sub kappa, but for its symmetrized version, which is called the Dunkel-Bessel function, because then the formulas are a little bit easier. But we have treated both cases. So these are the two papers where our results are. I recommend reading the second paper. Um, in the first paper, we were uh, not sure yet what would be the final form, and the simplex did not appear there yet. So this is where you can find the results. So this is my general form. If P is a polynomial, then the intertwining operator V sub kappa acting on P is given by this integral transform. So I'll explain what is here. I take my polynomial, I multiply with the Gauss factor, and I take the classical Fourier transform of it. Then I know that the result is again of the form polynomial times the Gauss factor. Right? This is a standard result. This I multiply with this function k, and then I integrate again. What is k? k is the Dunkel kernel on which I act with the exponential of minus the regular Laplacian. The, non, not the Dunkel Laplacian, but the regular Laplacian. Right? So this is, this is a complication. This is not so interesting, but this turns out to be computable. Um, abstractly, you can compute it as follows. Um, this follows from an identity of McDonald's. Um, you can write this as an integral um, or as a Fourier transform of um, uh, this, uh, the Dunkel kernel multiplied with a few Ga Gauss factors. This is not how we will compute it. In practice, you can, you can compute it directly. Um, so this is my formula. It looks a bit abstract. I will show you that it is indeed the intertwining operator. So I'll give you a proof of this. So I want to compute V sub kappa acting on uh, P derived in the direction J. So this is my formula. First, I pull partial derivative of j to the product p times the exponential. This creates uh, a factor x sub j. Right? This is just Leibniz's rule. Then I use the property of the classical Fourier transform. I intertwine this with the Fourier transform, goes through it, picks up a complex i, and the x's become y's. Uh, the, der the derivative becomes a variable, and the variable becomes a derivative. Now I use integration by parts. Integration by parts um, maps this derivative to minus that derivative, but now not acting on this, on, on this part, but acting on k, right? What is k? k is this exponential of the Laplacian acting on the Dunkel kernel. I can commute this through this factor, this is a standard compu uh, computation uh, with partial derivatives. 
And then what you uh, keep is just the derivative yj, uh, the, the multiplication by yj. Now we know what is this. Our Dunkel kernel is defined as the joint eigenfunction of all my Dunkel operators. So essentially what is written here is the Dunkel operator in z acting on e. There is no z in this integral, so I pull it out and I find what I need. So here you see, um, this is a, a formal manipulation that shows you um, how this works. Um, in, in the paper, we give the rest of the technical details. Some remarks. When kappa is zero, you observe immediately from this formula that you obtain the identity. The one dimensional case is again easy to verify. Uh, we think the general formula is new, but we, we are not sure. We, uh, we, we have never seen it before, but we don't find it unimaginable that other people have come up with this formula too. And you can write down, and this is coming back to John's question, a similar formula for V kappa inverse, um, so satisfying these properties, um, with a similar integral expression. This is also in our paper. And in the original paper of Dunkel, there is yet another exp expression um, that, that is much more familiar to some kind of Taylor expansion. Um, so, but, but this is the easier one of the two, the inverse transform. Good. Okay, I'm looking at time. So let's move on to the case of the dihedral groups. So, um, well, before doing that, I'm going to specialize my formula to uh, a symmetric version of the Dunkel kernel. This is called the generalized Bessel function. I'll abbreviate it as GBF. And what is this? This is the sum of my Dunkel kernel, where I let every element of my reflection group act on one of the variables and I uh, take an average. And I divide by the number of elements in my group. Um, if I now want to have the intertwining operator for G invariant polynomials, so polynomials that satisfy P where G acts on the argument, and this is equal to P of Z for all elements in my group, that's what I call an invariant polynomial. Then I find my intertwining operator by, in my previous formula, replacing the Dunkel kernel by this generalized Bessel function. So the, the formula is exactly the same. The only thing that is changing is that I have this um, uh, generalized Bessel function sitting. And so this is what I'll determine first in the case of dihedral groups, because this is the simplest and leads to the cleanest formulas. So, what will we do? We'll compute this generalized Bessel function as a Humbert function. We'll show that the Humbert function can be represented as an integral over a simplex, and we use our previous result to get the intertwining operator. In our paper, we have done the same thing for the Dunkel kernel and the full intertwining operator. This is uh, quite a bit more complicated, so I will just show the final results and not the technical steps there. So what is the second Humbert function? It's a um, hypergeometric function of several variables, of m variables of Loricella type. So the variables are, <coughs> apologies, x1 up to xm. So the raised to powers j1 up to jm, and I sum over all of these ji's. And then the real question is, what do I do with the parameters? Beta 1 up to beta m and gamma. And for the second Humbert function, they're organized in this particular way. You don't need to remember for the rest of this talk how they are organized. Um, this is just a definition. Why is this interesting? If the parameters are nice, this has a, a, a curious integral representation. This is, dates back to the book of Humbert, which is an old book um, or a paper, um, which is from the, from the 20s, I believe, 1920s. Essentially, this uh, Humbert function is an integral over the simplex of an exponential function of my variables, the inner product of my variables with the uh, coordinates of my simplex, and then uh, a certain weight, right? So this integral expression is the crucial final step to get the nice formula of the generalized Bessel function and later on the Dunkel kernel and the integral. So 
I need a starting point, and a starting point is a result from 2012 by Nizar Demni in the Journal of Lee Theory. There he determined the generalized Bessel function for the even dihedral groups and also for the odd ones, but I'll, I'll show the even case here, as follows. So this generalized Bessel function is a double integral from minus one to one um, over variables u and v um, that satisfy some kind of symmetrized beta distribution of a certain argument, f plus and f minus 2k. What is this uh, f plus and minus? These are two infinite series, series of Bessel functions, modified Bessel functions, and Gegenbauer polynomials. There are some numbers here, um, and there is a sign here. Um, now, this, uh, this series is very well known if k equals 1. This is then just an expansion of the regular exponential function. But when k is not one, this is complicated. Um, how is this connected with the variables z and w? I write z in polar form with an uh, angle uh, phi 1, w as an angle phi 2, and b is the product of the uh, moduli of z and w. Right? So this function depends on the product of the moduli, and then xi, which contains these angles in a fairly complicated way. So this xi is later on, the u and the v are integrated out of this form. So this is a fairly complicated form. What I will focus on is finding a new form for f plus minus. And I'm sorry, this, this is the technical part of the talk, um, but I'll, I'll hope to focus on, on the essential steps. So we want to, to study this. And what we will do is we will introduce an auxiliary parameter or variable, parameter t. And I add this at the argument of my Bessel function. So when I put t equal to one, I have the function I want, um, but now I let t be a real variable or a positive variable. Now I do the most classical of things. I take the Laplace transform. Laplace transform of this function with respect to t, and I map the variable t to the Laplace domain variable s. If I do that, and I can do that because the Bessel function has a, has a nice form, uh, a nice Laplace domain um, formula, then I get the following sequence uh, series. So my Bessel function vanishes, and it becomes this expression, s plus capital of r, which is a square root containing s. And this r is appearing here again. Now, the formula which is boxed here, this is a nice formula if you uh, step back a little bit. If you recall the Poisson formula in the plane, uh, or, or in Rm, then this is a sequence, um, a, a series of Gegenbauer polynomials multiplied by powers of z with a specific um, specific uh, prefactor, and this can be uh, uh, this equals this uh, simple rational function. Right? And what is written here is precisely of this form, only with a complicated z. Z is this now. So using the Poisson formula, I get a closed formula of f plus minus in the Laplace domain. So let's write it down. So this is a whole bunch of computations, of course, in between. So the Laplace transform of my series of Bessel functions multiplied with Gegenbauer's gives me first this Laplace uh, formula. And if I look a little bit at it, I can recognize that the nominator is the derivative of the denominator and I can hence get rid of the denominator. That gives me the same. Now this looks complicated, true. But it turns out that my denominator is actually very simple. This turns out to be a polynomial in the Laplace variable s that can be factored completely. This is not at all obvious because there are square roots here. So somehow all these square roots vanish again, if you do it in the correct way. And the result is the following. So, in the Laplace domain, my function that I'm after is the derivative of this thing. What is written here, this factors 
as the product of linear factors s minus b times some cosines with q um, connected to the argument of my um, best, uh, Gegenbauer polynomials. Right, so I have a nice factorization. Still, it's not uh, completely obvious because this factor polynomial is still raised to the power alpha plus beta. Now, what do you do to invert this Laplace transform? When alpha plus beta is integer, then this is uh, elementary, but complicated. You use a partial fraction decomposition into um, linear factors, and you can express the results in elementary functions. This is hard to do in general, though. Even though it is possible, um, it's hard to do. And it does not treat the non-integer case. And this is where the Humbert comes in play. When alpha plus beta is non-integer, you can recognize uh, the, the Laplace uh, transform of this Humbert function is known. This is in FDLA, uh, in one of his uh, long lists of, of Laplace transform tables. So you can write down the, Laplace trans the inverse Laplace transform of this thing. Then you put t equal to 1, and you have your um, generalized Bessel function. So let's move to the results. We started from this series. f plus minus is a series of Bessel functions with Gegenbauer polynomials. And we have a theorem that this equals um, second Humbert function with uh, k variables. And these variables are b. This was the product of the moduli of my arguments of the generalized Bessel function times the cosine of q. And q is this complicated argument um, that, we had in, um, that we have here as well. Now, if you look at this, and if you think a little bit, this Humbert function is also um, it's a hypergeometric function, so it's also a complicated function. So one might think this is just conservation of misery. Here you have an infinite series. Here you also have an infinite series. The only thing which is different is that it carries a name. But this is not the case. The Humbert function can be represented by this integral of an exponential over the simplex, and this allows you to take um, nice s to make good estimates of all these functions, which you cannot make using this initial expression. I should say that there are two expressions in terms of Humbert functions, depending on how you tweak your Laplace transform. The second expression is better than the first one. Okay, looking at the time a little bit. So, what is then the final result for my generalized Bessel function? My generalized Bessel function is an integral of an exponential over the simplex and over minus 1, 1. This is the symmetrized beta distribution. We have the typical uh, weight on the simplex sitting here. Uh, the tj's are the variables in my, my simplex. What is aj plus and aj minus? These are connected. Uh, to b, which is the product of the moduli of z and w, and the angles phi 1 and phi 2, the polar angles of z and w. So here you get a very concrete formula of this generalized Bessel function. What are the advantages? Well, you can read off that this generalized Bessel function is positive now, very simply. My exponential is positive, my measure is positive, um, hence, the result after integration is positive too. If you complexify this formula, you get some i's appearing in your exponential. You can compute bounds uh, of the modulus, and this, um, this turns out to be bounded by 1. So what are uh, complicated abstract results become observations once you have the explicit formula for, the, for, for, this, um, for this function. And that's why I like to call it a useful formula, right? So next step, we have the generalized Bessel function. How can we intertwine invariant polynomials now? So what were invariant polynomials? Polynomials which are invariant under any uh, element G of my dihedral group. Well, I apply my previous uh, general formula for arbitrary reflection groups. I plug in the expression we have found for um, the generalized Bessel function. We play around a little bit more. And what turns out 
is a formula like this. Um, this looks complicated and it is fairly complicated, but it is uh, essentially the best one can do. So again, an integral over the simplex of my polynomial evaluated in these two arguments. Um, note that these are, if my polynomial is real, then the evaluation in this is real as well. This is not so clear at first. This is a complex number, so you interpret it, um, the real part of this complex number as the first variable of p, and the imaginary part as the second variable of p. So it is really mapping real numbers to real numbers, what is written here. Um, what is my measure? My measure is um, uh, a polar version, a Bochner, polar Bochner representation of this original measure. This is also a crucial step that's a bit technical and I don't want to go into those details, but that allows you to write the result in this form. Okay, let me go over the changes that you need to make. Um, if you want to move to, uh, from the generalized Bessel function to the Dunkel kernel and from the intertwining operator for uh, invariant polynomials to arbitrary polynomials. Well, you need a series expansion for the Dunkel kernel first, E sub kappa. There is one determined by uh, Salem Ben Said in this uh, paper of 2007 in Journal of Functional Analysis writing it as a series of Bessel functions multiplied with pj's. In the uh, non-deformed case, these are the Gegenbauer polynomials. Here, these are reproducing kernels for spaces of spherical, uh, for Dunkel harmonics, and they are complicated and unknown polynomials. Um, so this is, this is an additional complication, right? But we can uh, continue in more or less the same way as before. We introduced this auxiliary variable t. This was not yet in, in Ben Said's paper. This is how we approached it. So put this t here, and at the end, put t back equal to 1. Laplace transform again in t. This is taken care of. What can you do with pj? Well, we can no longer use the regular Poisson kernel. We have to use the Dunkel Poisson kernel, which is uh, established in one. Uh, case of reflection groups, and that is precisely the case of dihedral groups in this um, old paper of Dunkel himself. So we can do exactly the same trick as before. We Laplace transform, we apply the Dunkel Poisson kernel, we find a closed form line in the Laplace domain, and we invert this. And this turns out to be again the Humbert function. But there is a bit of mess in front of it. So here is the result. If I have an even dihedral group and a positive multiplicity function, the Dunkel kernel is a double integral over my symmetrized uh, beta distributions of this function, which is again a Humbert 2 function. But now I have uh, this uh, additional part of my measure um, that I need in order to get the Dunkel kernel and not just the, the Dunkel Bessel function. Um, my Humbert function has as uh, parameters alpha plus beta, so the sum of my uh, parameters in the multiplicity function. Um, and the variables are a naught up to a k, which are similar as in the case of the Dunkel, the generalized Bessel function. Again, what is nice about this formula, or what makes it somehow an optimal formula, you can read off the positivity of the Dunkel kernel. I, told you um, when we started the, the part of our approach that we know that the Dunkel kernel is positive because it is the intertwining operator acting on the positive exponential. Here you can read it off. Um, my phi 2 can be represented as an integral over the simplex and hence uh, becomes positive. The measure is positive and this is this complicated function in brackets this is elementary to show that this is positive as well within the integration domain. So again, you have a nice positive function. What happens if you then try to compute the intertwining operator for any polynomial? You can do that now using our uh, abstract formula that we developed. And you get a formula like this. So V kappa acting on a polynomial 
is given by an integral over the plane followed by an integral uh, um, preceded by an integral over the simplex of p evaluated in uh, fairly complicated arguments um, and where the measure is again um, a Bogner version of the measure in our Dunkel kernel. So the, the symmetrized beta functions multiplied with this complicated thing in the square brackets. Right? Um, again, this formula allows you to conclude the positivity of the Dunkel intertwining operator. If a polynomial P is positive, and this is positive, my integral over the simplex will not change that. And this measure, uh, we have already established that it was a positive measure. So positive polynomial is mapped to positive uh, intertwined polynomial. So this is, um, uh, this is what we liked to have, to, to better understand what was happening in, in Margit Russell's approach to the intertwining operator from the very abstract point. So I'm almost at the end. Um, what I'm claiming here is that we have found somehow the, the correct or the best formulas for the Dunkel kernel and the intertwining operator in the case of dihedral groups. What do I mean by that? I mean two things by it. First of all, the abstract results, such as positivity and boundedness, followed by observation. And this is how it should be. When you study the, the, the classical Fourier transform, if you would have to work there to, to show that the exponential integral kernel is bounded by one, that would not be very hopeful for subsequent Fourier analysis. And here you have that, that immediate observation. And the second part is that our approach follows a structural method. We, um, in principle, if parts, uh, the same steps can be taken for other reflection groups, but you will have difficulties um, finding certain, certain other expressions. For example, um, you need knowledge of the Dunkel Poisson kernel. So this, this is a, a stumbling block there. Nevertheless, there may still be better formulas from a computational point of view. If you want to actually compute intertwined polynomials, it may be possible to rewrite our results, or in fact, it is possible to rewrite our results in a few other ways. Uh, some are listed in our papers. Um, and it's not so clear which for computational purposes, which would really be the most convenient uh, formulation there. So this is my first outro. And then the second outro is another paper by Xu, uh, posted uh, one month ago, I believe, where he goes to symmetric groups. So acting in um, symmetric groups, acting in RD. And again, he finds a formula for the intertwining operator, but under uh, restrictions. What are the restrictions? Well, he is essentially considering functions that only depend on one variable, say xl. And then he finds the intertwining operator acting on such a polynomial or on such a function, again by an integral over a simplex. So this is, this is curious, right? Um, what can I say about this formula? So you can, you can read the de details in this, in this very recent paper. Um, his proof is elementary. It's only one page. It's much simpler than the case of dihedral groups. Um, but it's again for only a restricted class of functions. And from his approach, it's very unclear how to generalize to more uh, arbitrary classes of functions. Again, it's curious that the simplexes appear. So what we are trying to do now uh, uh, with my collaborator, Pan Lian, is we are trying to re refine uh, Xu's formula using our approach and to extend it, uh, for example, in the case of um, uh, invariant polynomials. And it seems possible to, to at least do that for invariant polynomials. Getting the full intertwining operator still seems like a challenging uh, task. So uh, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to answer questions if you have some. Thank you very much, Andre. So we have uh, plenty of time for uh, questions. Any people wants to uh, ask question? John has already lifted his <laughs> hand. Go Are ahead, John. That? <laughs> okay. So I have actually I have two questions. Uh, one probably for the experts, it's a, an obvious one, but 
you presumably have for each of these dunkel uh, systems related to reflection groups, you do have some kind of family of integrable systems which are defined by these Hamiltonians. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. And can these intertwining operators just give you the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonians by applying them to the uh, free Laplace? Um, I want to say yes, in principle, um, but probably only for, for suitable potentials like harmonic potentials or things like that. Um, but but this intertwining operator would play a role there too. Yes, to to get uh, uh, explicit uh, expressions. That was the first part of my question. I, there's a nod to Luke because I imagine that these Rodrigue formulas, which you derived a long time ago, could perhaps be got in this way uh, by using the intertwining operators. I don't know. <clears throat> but I have a second question, and that is. You yeah. know, there's this amazing connection between um, between finite uh, particle integrable systems like Kelleger Moser and so on, and integrable hierarchies like the KP hierarchy, etc. And uh, well, there's a connection both classically and quantum mechanically. You, really, you're dealing with quantum systems because it's these uh, generalized Laplacians. But um, there's something very reminiscent. And I just want to ask you if you've thought about this at all. There is, of course, many ways to connect Kelleger Moser flows to certain solutions, rational solutions of KP. That's a classical connection. But there's also some beautiful work of uh, Anton Zabrodin, which connects the classical, I guess, particle system, no, the classical uh, hierarchy to the quantum particle system. Um, your intertwining operator looks to be playing a role somewhat similar to the dressing operator which is used in the uh, you know in the dressing method for solving integrable hierarchies and there is this connection between the two do you have any idea or have you thought at all about whether there's some way to link up the intertwining operator and the dressing operator for things like kp hierarchy um no, because I'm I'm not a specialist in those things. Um, uh, but that that uh, that sounds like an interesting uh, a question or topic. Um, what I can say is that when we were developing this work, we were always trying to to come up with methods methods which had a, um, a degree of of uh, uh, generality to them, so that they could be applied equally to other situations. Um, and it would be, uh, I, I would be very happy to see this applied in, 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 in other domains, uh, be it of, of classical analysis or, or of, of uh, integrable systems or, or anywhere else. Um, because I have, a f I, to me, it feels quite natural what we are doing and, and I would hope for more applications. If you could send me this paper you are referring to, that, that would be very helpful. Oh, uh, there are many papers, but uh, there are two connections. There's a classical connection, which goes way, way back <coughs> to, oh gosh, uh, to uh, uh, Errol McKean Moser. And there's also a quantum connection that goes back some 35 years. But there's also, uh, well, I mean, which just says that, that uh, uh, Kaloger Moser flows can be embedded into certain rational solutions of the KP hierarchy in a very simple way. But there's a much more interesting connection which maybe is closer to what you are doing with intertwining operators. And that I can I can tell you, I can send you the papers. There's a couple of papers by Anton Zabrodin, which just makes a beautiful uh, correspondence between the quantum problems of uh, interacting particle systems and the classical problems of integrable hierarchies. And uh, well, it would be tempting to think there is a link with uh, the uh, dressing method, which resembles this uh, intertwining operator. Yeah, that that would, yeah. If you can send some, that uh, I would highly appreciate that. Okay. It doesn't have to be immediate. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Luke has a question now. Yes. Hi, Hendrik. Good to see you, uh, even from the distance. Good to see you, Luke. 
Um, so, well, John alluded to uh, the question uh, was asked. I, I wanted to connect to. Um, there was one instance where I really used the inter Dunkel intertwining operator. It was with um, Alexei Zhidanov, who's also uh, somewhere listening, where we connect, we use it. So we, uh, it, it was in the case of the simplest situation with the Z2, where, as you say, everything is basically known, but we could apply it to the Jacobi polynomial to obtain the little minus one Jacobi polynomials. These, these polynomials that, that we like that are <coughs> uh, limits when Q goes to minus one of some Q deformed polynomial. And uh, so, so, my, so it relates to what John is saying because of course the, uh, say the Calogero Sutherland model is formulated you know, using Dunkel operators, but restricting, this is less clear, to symmetric function, to the symmetric part of, of the function. So, so my question is, do, do you, can you envisage or do you already know example of uh, interesting polynomials that could be obtained from applying the intertwine, you, you know, say in the dihedral case, the intertwining operators that you have from more standard two variable, up, you know, polynomials on the plane, say the, the Jacobi polynomials of Kornwinder on the plane or things like that. Um, so there is a paper by, by Dunkel um, where he determines the action of the, the dihedral intertwining operator on all polynomials in the plane. But so he, he starts from monomials, say z to the power j times c bar to the power k, and then he computes um, complicated expressions for that. Um, and this is most definitely connected to certain families of orthogonal polynomials, although I don't know by heart which ones are appearing there. What, uh, what was not present there is this interpretation of positivity. This was completely non-obvious from the formulas he could compute. So our formulas are really, uh, and, and this, uh, let me go back a little bit. This is what I was trying to say here, that our results are somehow the best ones if you want to look at these things. If you want to do computations, then maybe our formulas are not the best ones. Um, we, it would still be interesting to match up our results with Dunkel's very explicit expressions for polynomials and see if that gives more interpretations to these polynomials. Um, but we haven't gotten around to that. Yet. So why are you saying that your formula, that this is precisely what I had in mind and, and uh, Charles Dunkel have been often telling me that uh, he felt we should use as uh, dihedral polynomials in, in some of the uh, applications that some of which we've done together. Uh, but what, why would your formulas not help advance the understanding of these polynomials? Well, let me show you. Uh, so the, the problem is somehow hidden away this is our intertwining operator. It's hidden away in this measure, which is a complicated beast. Um, I don't have it on my slides, but it essentially makes it very hard to compute with this thing. <laughs> um, you know nice things about the measure, um, but I, I would not really like to compute too many things with it. Um, so, so it has the, the upside is that you, you get these nice abstract results for free, more or less. But the downside is that if you want to do the computations, like Dunkel's computations, then, then, it's, then his approach is maybe more suitable. But then in his approach, you don't see the positivity and the bounds and so on. So it's, it's, uh, you have to choose what you want somehow. But it, it's clear. Um, Maybe I should say that the formulas that Xu is making, those are always practical. So he somehow seems to be able to find precisely those. Um, so like, like this formula here, this is a practical formula. Because 
this is just an integral over the simplex. There is no strange measure. This is just a standard measure on the simplex. This you can compute with, and that's also what he does in this paper. He uses it to, to study some kind of summability properties of, of all kinds of harmonics. So for sure there are, um, probably what one would need to do is to build special cases of our general formula that become useful in computations. But I'm not sure which one are, which ones would be the useful ones. And and just on John's point, do you, are, are your formulas passing to uh, to the symmetric uh, quotients? Uh, so suppose you apply your operator to and you 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 want to symmetrize the function. I'm not sure I understood fully the details because you were looking at symmetrize the Bessel functions. But say, say it would not apply because it's not the dihedral situation. But I'm I'm looking at McDonald polynomials uh, or Jack polynomials. Uh, could I have the pre-image of these polynomials under these uh, intertwining operators? And uh, can you do this uh, symmetrization? and, and uh, recover the formula and presumably what he was referring to is, is the, uh, you know, the, uh, the raising operators. So can one find the raising operators from the uh, jack for the jack polynomials from those that would be the pre-image under the uh, intertwining operators? That is what he was uh, referring to, I believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, what is known is um, there is a formula for the generalized Bessel function in the symmetric case. And this can also be expressed as some kind of Humbert function. So you would get a similar kind of formulas that we have here. Um, but we are still in the process of, of figuring out some of the details. So I don't dare to say at this point whether that would help there or not, but it, for certain it's an encouragement to look further into this. Um, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's hard to, exp to, to, to predict how complicated the resulting formulas are with these type of, of uh, yeah. computations. <laughs> and another problem with this Dunkel, uh, maybe I should go back to the beginning. So the Dunkel transform is very nice in the sense that it maps, so the, the, the Dunkel integral transform maps Dunkel operators to variables and vice versa. But for the intertwining operator, we only know what it does with derivatives and Dunkel operators. We don't know what it does with variables. And this is, uh, so you cannot just try to get certain commutators to pull them through the, the intertwining operator, this doesn't work very well. Um, and this is an additional problem, I think. Um, especially thinking on these, if you would have a lateral operator on the one hand, and then you would, the idea would be to pull it through, uh, this may be very complicated. Thanks. Thank you. So thank you, Hendrik. It was very nice. I'm, I have a button that allows me to uh, open all the microphones. I don't know if it works, but in any case, I will clap to thank you. <laughs> so anyone who wants to join me, thank you very much, Hendrik. Uh, next week is uh, Alex Maloney from McGill. I'm still waiting for the title. Uh, but he's a really remarkable speaker. So join us again next week. And again, uh, thank you, Andre, for the nice talk. Uh, just, I, I have a question again, please. Yes, who, who has a question? Who? Uh, 91886, uh, uh, this number. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, about the support of the measure. In this uh, case of the other group, is it uh, the support is uh, explicit in this case? Because I think in uh, general case is uh, an open problem again. Um, the support of the measure is explicit. Yes. Is it uh, the convex hull of uh, the orbit? Uh, 
Can you repeat that again? Because in the case, I think uh, we know that uh, the support uh, of uh, when x is fixed is uh, contained in the convex hole of the orbit of x. But in, in this case, is it exactly this or uh, is uh, a strict subset or what? Uh, so, so which domain? Uh, so, I, I'm assuming you are talking about uh, a formula like this one, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah so we know the support of this thing. Um, uh, it's essentially. Um, um, how should I say that? It's it's like one small triangle, like the the uh, with with angle. Uh, Two pi over k, mm -hmm. right? So that will be the integration domain here. And I think this is uh, similar to what has appeared in some other papers as well. I'm not sure if this is the the question. Yeah, the question because I, I think uh, in general case for uh, general uh, arbitrary section uh, uh, group, we know that the the support is contained in the convex hull of uh, the orbit of X. This one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, in, in, in this case, we have the equality or not? I would have to, to look at the details to, to give you a precise answer. Okay. Yeah. Would you care to identify yourself, uh, 918, please? Yeah, Rajab uh, Shaban from uh, Sherbrooke University. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you. so again, um, thank you, Andre. And uh, let's hope that you'll all join us uh, next week. <laughs>